Okay, welcome everyone to my continuation of what are my favorite theorems by biased collection. Um, of course, today not really a theorem, but rather a story about many theorems. Stories, um, I'm not quite sure if I'll ever tell you anything else than stories, which is kind of fine. Um, but anyway, today it's really just a large story. And I'm kind of seeing this as a part of three videos I'm making in a row. I kind of want to explain a little bit what the monster liage is and that's just kind of difficult right so just put it in one video is just really difficult the construction is really involved and even the kind of the ideas behind it and are not completely easy to explain in one video so i break it into smaller bits and i hope kind of this video convinces you a little bit at least that constructing those groups which i will call sporadic groups which i will call sporadic groups but sounds a bit funny they are called sporadic groups um, they're, they're a bit weird, actually. Um, yeah, but somehow weird is interesting. Yeah, uh, If you're not, eh, well, weird is clearly interesting. Unique unique people are very interesting. So unique things are kind of really interesting. They're not like the everyday nonsense. But they're also a bit difficult to kind of compress into one video. So I'm trying my best to kind of explain a little bit more uh, the history around them than to give you too many details. It's kind of what a YouTube video is supposed to do in some sense, I guess. Uh, anyway, hopefully it will be uh, reasonably enjoyable. So here I have this beautiful um, periodic table that I really just stole. I also have another video on this periodic table and it's kind of really nice. So you can actually download it and that's a really high resolution. So um, there's original PDF and you can really just zoom into this shit and the resolution is really good um, as you can see. And it lists, we go to this in a second, the finite simple groups, and they come in, they come in classes like in the period table. And in this funny list, what you see is kind of the name for the group and then the order of the group, right? And we will look at those guys in a second. Um, but they kind of form like nice families. Essentially, that's what it is. And they have some nice uh, little uh, symbols here. And they have the sporadic groups, which is this, this video. The title of the video is sporadic. Okay, let's go back to the slide. So if you want to download this really fantastic table, uh, the link is in the description. Anyway, so on the slide, uh, keep in mind we have this periodic table and the simple group is essentially an element of group theory. It's a group without substructure and you want to write down this periodic table of finite simple groups. And to, to really get this table that you see here so innocently uh, sitting at the top of the slide, it's actually one of the main achievements of the last century and it's still kind of work in progress. Uh, so the classification of finite simple groups work in progress in the sense that it's clearly closed. So nobody, nobody that I know uh, believes that there's some mistake anywhere, but the kind of the truth is like horrible. It's like a tremendous number of pages and I'm not even sure if anyone really has digested the, the whole thing. Um, whether that matters or not, whatever, there's certainly some simplifications you can do. And in this, that sense, it's, it's kind of still a work in progress. But anyway, finding this periodic table of uh, those finite simple groups was one of the main achievements um, of the whole story. And then there's some pattern that you always see somewhat. Uh, most of them are actually really easy. And then some of them are really like tricky. And most of the work will go into the sum of them. So if you ever write a thesis or paper or whatever, most of the work actually will go into some really silly stuff. And um, most of the paper itself is actually quite easy to read and to write, the work of the thesis itself. The same here. Most groups on this list, essentially everything, let me just let me just uh, be not very precise, essentially everything in this bubble here is, is easy. It's a group of lead types. Which is not quite true, but let, let's ignore the subtlety. So the alternating groups are here, for example. Uh, let's just pretend to so the first uh, column. Let's just pretend they are symmetric groups. And symmetric groups are kind of groups of lead type of the general linear group over one field. And then you have the kind of the real groups of lead type, which is all this bunch of shit here. Um, and then you have the cyclic groups. And let me just let me just say cyclic groups are also groups of Lie type in some certain sense, they correspond to some complex reflection groups, whatever. Let me just, they're, they're easy enough to just uh, just put them in the list of groups of Lie type. Just be careful that I'm probably the only one who does that. Anyway, so I will call the whole bubble upstairs 
groups of elite type. They're kind of the well-known ones. They were around for a long time and people know what they are. So essentially what they are is something like SL2 over a finite field, SL3 over a finite field. That's essentially what they are. SO15 over a finite field with this coefficient in the finite field. That's essentially what they are. And then there are those beasts down here, which make kind of the whole story uh, interesting. What would be a good color, good contrast, maybe blue, um, and they're called sporadic loops. It's kind of a weird classification. So let's just say everything is a, a finite simple group except 24 exceptions. And these are the sporadic groups. Uh, sorry, everything is a group of Lie type except 24 exceptions. And these are the sporadic groups. And the groups of Lie type are always easy to construct. As I just said, there's usually something, let me try to write it somewhere on the slide. Uh, maybe this slide has more space. There's usually something like an SL2 over the field with whatever. Uh, 27 elements, something like that. It's not quite true, but it's kind of true enough. So you always construct them as some type of a matrix algebra. Very natural construction, so they're kind of easy. And then you have those guys who are not really matrix algebra in any such straightforward way. And these are the sporadic groups in my little blue bubble uh, down here. And a lot of work, and we'll go to that in a second, on the kind of the middle of the last century went into understanding those Sporadic groups. Essentially, not quite true, but let's just say for this video, essentially everything in the finite in the groups of lead type was known, and the only interesting ones were the sporadic groups. They're kind of different, right? So you have kind of a party, and essentially everyone belongs to one group, and then there are some weird people uh, like me standing around somewhere, and they don't belong anywhere. And that's essentially what the sporadic groups are in this picture. They're the kind of the weird elements of the story. They don't fall into some nice family. Essentially, that's what it's supposed to be. Take everything I say with a grain of salt. And the history is roughly the following. So we have those 24 here. I zoomed in a little bit. They have some funny symbols. Don't worry about the symbols too much. They're essentially named after the people who discovered them. So J is, for example, the Jenko, and um, M is the Mathieu, and uh, HS is Hickman Sims, or something like that. Um, so that's what it is. And they have the five groups called M, so M11, 12, 22, 23, and 24, they were discovered a long time ago, essentially already around the same time when the groups of Lie type were discovered. And they arise as certain generalizations of symmetric groups, if you want. And it's a bit of a mystery, by the way, it's a bit of a mystery in general in the story, that you always end up with finitely many sporadic groups, a priori, there could be infinitely many of them, but no, you only have finitely many, they don't fall into nice families, whatever. And essentially a long time ago, they were constructed as symmetries of nice, nice spaces, the Klein quadric or something like that, um, although that construction came a little bit later. But anyway, so essentially they were known to be symmetries of nice spaces, and usually what happens for those funny sporadic groups, it's the symmetries of the nice spaces, are nice groups, they are known. So you need to throw in some extra symmetries, which always looks a bit random, but those groups are a bit random. Okay. So in this case, they are just symmetries of some nice spaces, some with the hyperbolic spaces in this case for M34. And yeah, so they are augmented symmetries of natural appearing objects, and they were discovered a long time ago. And then essentially nothing happened. And that's the whole problem with those parallel groups, because they're usually symmetries of nice objects. But not quite. They need to be augmented. And the augmentation is usually really difficult. Or as soon as someone tells you how to do it, it's not so difficult to verify. But to come up with the construction is like, ooh, like, like tricky in nano. Anyway, so that's roughly the story. And if you want to pause the video or quit the video, this is a good point to quit it because essentially the sporadic groups are always symmetries of a natural object. And then you need to augment them because otherwise it would just be one of the uh, groups, uh, kind of the known groups in my top bubble group. That's essentially what it is. And the, the, the first bunch of them, the first five of them were discovered in 1860, roughly ish, plus minus something, as usual. Okay. And then it took a, a long time. So, in a, really a long time, let's say 100 years later, Genko kind of the brute force constructed uh, and courses um, constructed four more groups. They don't fall in any family. They're just named after the person. So they have essentially nothing to do with one another. 
But anyway, so J1, J2, J3, and J4, and they were the first sporadic groups for 100 years. So the construction is not completely trivial. Um, essentially, there's a symmetry of natural objects. So uh, as J2 is essentially the symmetries of the final plane, but then there are some augmented things, and the augmented things make them uh, so kind of difficult. And this was kind of the, the start of the golden era, and all of the others were kind of constructed in the next 20 years. So all of the rest here were then uh, kind of found using kind of the same type of strategies. You take a phaino plane, you do something with a phaino plane, uh, something like that. Not, not quite, but roughly you take some natural object that you already know, symmetries, and you augment the symmetries. And this was really kind of a, a shock for the community. So here I have this quote that I found on Wikipedia, which is actually very nice. So the group theorist Bertrand Rupert set up of J1, which was the first one discovered. There were a very few things that surprised me in my life. There were only the following two events that really surprised me. The discovery of the first Jenko group, so it really came out of nowhere, and the fall of the Berlin Wall. Fine. Okay. I'm, I'm not into history in this video, so let's ignore the fall of the Berlin Wall, and let's just go for the discovery of the first Jenko group. It really came out of nowhere, like 100 years, and it just pop, popped out. And that's usually how those sporadic groups work. They just pop out, and then you don't really know what to do. And that's kind of why it's also so difficult to explain them in one video, because the construction, I would, there is no kind of general construction as far well as I know. You would just go through every one of them and construct some funny object. I'll, I'll give you some examples how to do J2 uh, on the final slide. But for now, it's always the same idea. They are augmented symmetries of natural appearing objects. Augmentation is a difficult part. And funnily, by surprise of nature, there are only always finally many of those. Um, anyway, so Jenko discovered them and shortly after, um, everything else was kind of also discovered. And then it took a long time to prove that there's nothing else. That's essentially uh, the story, at least for this version. And the theorem is then there are exactly 24 of them. And they appear, well, there's a largest one. It's kind of the most famous one. Big is good, in case you haven't noticed that. Big, large is always good. Large, if you're large, large is always fantastic. So there's the biggest one. And it gets the most attention because it's the biggest one. Again, large is fantastic. Um, and essentially everything, you can kind of see the subgroup lattice here, is a subgroup of that one, not quite everything, but essentially everything. And all of them can be kind of constructed as augmented symmetries of natural appearing objects. For example, that was my whole idea to kind of roughly explain, obviously, how the, how the monster itself, the biggest one, so the one here on the top M, is kind of a symmetry of a certain Lie algebra which has a name, Monster Lie. Fine. So in some sense, it's also a group of Lie type, if you want. So everything that in the end uh, will be a group of Lie type. Anyway, so this was one of the key achievements of, in mathematics of the last century, writing down the, uh, the um, what is it, the periodic table of finite simple groups. And as I said, everything mostly in my little table here is like easy. So here, check if you want, and then uh, here, big question mark, and then they are kind of really difficult, usually construction. So, roughly to show you how that works, J2 is, I like to think about it as symmetries of the Fano plane plus extra, but in the end, it's a symmetry group of a, a graph with 100 vertices, which has this picture where you can't see anything because it has tremendous 100 vertices and a tremendous amount of edges. Um, I could count the number of edges, but let, no, let's not count them. Um, and this is essentially the symmetry group. Um, this is not quite true that it's a mod 2 extension, but fine. Who, who cares? So it's um, the symmetry group of this graph, uh, HJ. Okay, so J, J for J4. Um, and yeah, so it's a really large graph. And roughly the construction works as follows. That's why I like to think about this picture. And roughly that's a similar construction for all sporadic groups. That's what I'm just saying here right now. This is kind of very false if you look at the details, but the overall flavor is not, not that not, not that false. Okay, construction is roughly the following. Take our little plane, plane. I can zoom into the plane plane a little bit more. It has seven points and seven lines. 
Okay, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, uh, seven lines. You can kind of count them. Note that in the Fano plane that the circle is actually a line, um, kind of fun uh, fact of naming in geometry. Anyway, so there are seven points and seven lines, and you add one dummy and 21 flux. So a flux is really just um, uh, a, a point line pair. So a, a point here, P, lying on a line L, that's a flux. So you have uh, 21 of them, if you just count. Every point lies on three lines, so you have 20, and you have seven lines, so you have 20, 21 of them. So you have seven points and seven lines, you have one dummy vertex, and you have uh, 21 flux. This gives you a graph with 36 vertices, which comes directly from the final plane. Okay. And that graph, I haven't told you how to connect them, but you connect edges, uh, vertices, according to how they appear uh, on the final plane. It's, it's not so difficult to do it. Anyway, so you get this graph with 36 vertices. You compute its automorphism group, and you realize that up to a Z mod 2 extension again, the automorphism group is a unitary group. And the unitary group has an associated um, form because it's a unitary group. And from that form, you can cook up 30, 63 um, more vertices because those, the form gives you a, a, a way to, to construct involutions on that thing. And you do that um, and you get additional vertices and you connect them according to, again, some form of rule. Uh, depending on what the symmetries do to the final plane. And you get a graph with 99 vertices, and you need to add another dummy, fine. So you get two dummies, actually. And you get a graph with 100 vertices, whose symmetry group is essentially the Jacob group. Good. That was a mouthful. Um, that's essentially how it usually goes. There is some, OK, you construct the graph from the final plane. Fine, we can do that. People would do that eventually, right? Final plane, people construct graphs out of the final planes. And I haven't told you the rules, how to, how to do this for, for the 36 vertices. But essentially, um, you connect them according to connection in the or connection or non-connection in the panel. Right. Fine. OK. People would do that eventually. Uh, fine. That's what I understand. And then somehow, there's a magic construction to get no vertices out of the symmetry group of that graph itself um, to get to 100 vertices. And the symmetry group of that one is the Jenko group, the Jenko 2 group. No wonder it took 100 years to discover that piece, because who would do that? I mean, anyway, it's, it's really brilliant somehow. Um, and all other sporadic groups have kind of similar construction. You start with a natural object, you discover some extra symmetries on that object, you add them in, you get a bigger graph, and the symmetry group of that graph is uh, your sporadic group. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this video about elements in group theory and why some of them are like really difficult to construct and i also hope to see you next time